Hey, Bay Church. We are so grateful you tuned in to our online experience today. We hope that you might feel encouraged during these times where we really need to come together. We wanna know, where are you watching from? Feel free to type it into the chat and we, along with a few of our friends, would love to just get connected, um, greet you, and send you some love. And don't forget to let us know how you're doing during the service today. There might be a song, that song, that really encourages you, or something that is said that really captivates your heart. Uh, this would be a great time to click that heart button, use some emojis, let us know how you're feeling. Our online hosts are, are waiting to connect with you. They're there to answer any questions you have and offer you prayer if you need that as well. If this is your first time joining us, welcome to the Bay Church family. Uh, we just want to personally connect with you and we have a gift just for you. All you have to do is click welcome on the top right of your screen or on the top left for all of you mobile watchers. Mm -hmm. Today we're continuing with our 10 contentment series with a timely message from Pastor John on the topic, the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. You can follow along with the message in the notes section, which is right next to the chat tab. And for you families, we have services for kids available. So just click kids on your screen and they'll be able to engage with services there. Let's get ready for worship.
Hallelujah. Yes, God can do all things but fail. And we serve a mighty God. Amen. Um, amen to that. Uh, let's continue on with our worship through giving. We want to thank you for your continued generosity, which has helped to be a resource in advancing the mission of this church and God's plan. You know, here at the Bay Church, we're all about loving God and loving people. And it's our heart's desire to see that every person in the Bay Area that does not know Christ develop a personal relationship with him, as well as mature those who are fully devoted followers of Christ. And we want to just thank you so much for partnering with the Bay Church through your giving. Uh, because of that, we've been able to reach more people than ever before. So with that being said, there's three ways that you can give today. You can text to give the number on the screen. You can click the give button and you can also mail in your giving to the address that's located in the note section. Can we pray together? Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for every person who's watching right now, yes, God. Lord. We ask that you touch the hearts and minds of those that are, are watching, Lord Jesus, and we pray that whatever is on their heart to give to the advancement of your kingdom, that it be used to build up and not to tear down. God, we are just so grateful and appreciative for how you provided for us all and how you continue to let your will and your word go forth. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give, and let's continue to worship. Mm -hmm.
my life I will build my life on you A very warm welcome to you as we share this time together each weekend, uh, growing and learning in God's Word, the Bible. I need to tell you uh, this weekend that I come to teach God's Word uh, as a human being, as a follower of Christ, as the pastor of a local church, as an American, with a very heavy heart. And if you're uh, wondering what's going on in my heart, I'm sure it's the same thing going on in your heart. Because we awakened again last week to the death of another innocent American on the streets of Minneapolis, George Floyd on May 25th was killed uh, in a police action. In February, we had another young American man in the south of our land, Ahmad Arbery. In March, we had a beautiful young woman by the name of Brianna Taylor. Three times in three months, this travesty has happened. And it has all the bearing in the world on our Bible study today, which is the sixth commandment of the 10. Now, all these acts of violence, these senseless tragedies are happening against the backdrop of this COVID pandemic, which has taken over 100,000 American lives some 40 million jobs, our financial future, and a tragic, devastating increase during this shelter-in-place order in domestic violence. This is why my heart is heavy. God loves people more than anything, and he wants you and I to love people more than anything. Remember the portion of the Ten Commandments that we're in right now are the last six commandments. And remember, the first four have to do with our relationship with God, but these final six, they have to do with our relationship with each other, you to me and me to you, how we care for one another, how we love one another, how we treat one another, 
how we do life together, one another. And these words are very simple. There are only four in the 13th verse of Exodus chapter 20, and they are, you shall not murder. Say that with me wherever you may be. You shall not murder. There's only two aspects to our Bible study because it's not a complicated Bible study. It's very direct and very clear and very understandable. Let's talk first of all about the meaning. What is the simple meaning? What is the Father saying when he says, my children, my creation created in my image, fearfully and wonderfully made. As you're learning to love one another, that will imply that you will never do violence to another human being because you shall not murder, thus saith the Lord. And as we talk about the meaning of you shall not murder, let me say first of all, and make notice of this in your notes, God is asking us to revere all human life because all human life is created in his image. And that includes disabled human life, human life that comes out uh, in some sense in our eyes, damaged, defective, less than perfect, perfect. No, no, what that teaches us is a whole new way to love and care for one another and serve one another. When God gave us our directions in the garden, in the book of Genesis, he not only wanted us to tend the garden and care for the garden, he wanted us to tend and care for one another. This sixth commandment of God's big 10 forbids the intentional killing of another human being. And here is the historical record of the human family since our beginning. Violence consumes the human heart. Murder consumes the human heart. Evil toward one another has consumed the human heart. Since our fall in a garden due to sin, and we don't talk enough about sin, due to sin, the fall, Human beings created in God's image are obsessed with doing violence to one another. Ever since Cain and Abel, the first two brothers, when the warm blood of his murdered brother flowed upon the hands, the jealous hands of Cain and his jealousy, his revenge was sated. Ever since that moment, this sin disease of murder toward one another has lurked in the human heart. By the time an American child reaches the age of 18, they will have seen hundreds and probably thousands of murders, from video games to online to media to the internet to social media to to, uh, reality television to a thousand different settings. We are filling the minds of our sons and daughters and our grandchildren with violence toward one another. This is why they're acting it out. In our own nation, many times, statistically speaking, in the last 10, 20, 30 years, our own nation's capital, Washington, D.C., has been the murder capital of the United States of America, this land of the free and the home of the brave. We're experiencing a suicide epidemic, including in our armed forces, Drunk driving deaths uh, are 50,000 American lives killed every two years. That's how many lives were taken in 10 years in the Vietnam War. Every two years, drunk driving. You say, John, why would you bring up drunk driving? Because is it not a weapon of violence when intoxicated out of our mind, we get behind a motor, the wheel of a motor vehicle weighing thousands of pounds and hurtle down our freeways, clueless to what we're doing? Abortion on demand continues to take thousands of lives every day. Some 50 million 
since abortion on demand was legalized in 1973. And in case you're unfamiliar with this number of 50 million, that is 10 times more than all American war dead combined in the history of these United States of America. And I'm just touching on a few observations of how relevant these four words are in the planet today, in our hearts today, when God says, do not murder one another. Do not intentionally take the life of another human being. It is sacred and it is mine. And I've created each life for my holy pleasure. So from Cain and Abel, I could mention names historically and whole images are aroused in our imaginations of Genghis Khan and, and Mao Zedong and Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler and Napoleon Bonaparte and, and, and to illustrate the murderously sin-darkened condition of the human soul. We do violence to one another on a daily basis. I will say in passing that this do not commit murder contextually in scripture does not include self-defense uh, in your home and somebody is trying to do you harm or violation. Not that you're trying to kill a person, but just to defend yourself. It doesn't include accidental killings because accidental killings do happen. It doesn't include defending one's nation and home when in a state of war. But you could really argue about the just nature of any war. And I don't think any war at the end of the day could be defined as just. Here's an interesting thing in Ecclesiastes 8.11. The Bible says, when the sentence for a violent crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. It was true then and it's true today. As we continue to look through history, I also indict the Christian faith, among which I number my life and my family's life. We have some dark moments that should bring us great shame and cause us to repent. If I say the word, the Crusades, many Western Christians are not aware that there was a period of 300 years where violence was done by Christians, largely to Muslims. Ask the next Muslim friend, your neighbor, a, a, a colleague at work about the Crusades. They will help you understand during World War II, the church and the Vatican were absolutely complicit with the genocide against the Jews. The church has been silent at many, many times to its own shame, including during the great civil rights uh, marches and speeches of Dr. King in the 60s. If you trail the church and its own treatment of the Jewish people through these last 2,000 years, feeling that they are Christ killers, that they murdered Jesus. It is a great shame and a blot and a stain upon the church. If you look further around our globe today, we were just in a conversation with some of the leaders here in Contra Costa County. Are we aware that the Bay Area is a place of slavery, of work slavery and sex slavery against undocumented workers, undocumented individuals? Each one of these created precious in the sight of God. Are we not doing a, a violence against one another? I'm just giving you historical observations. I take you to our founding fathers. I could take you to comment on the principal author of the Declaration of Independence, our third president, Thomas Jefferson of Monticello, who is constantly lauded for his scientific and literary and political genius. And that may be true, but at the same time, he was a profligate slaveholder. I checked statistically. Thomas Jefferson 
owned 600 human beings in his life. The man who wrote the Declaration of Independence that said, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Additionally, there was some version of sex slavery with Sally Hemmings, Hemmings through whom he fathered six children. Check it out, Google it. My purpose today is not to find fault, but we see something like do not murder, and we say, John, this is simply just not relevant. Nothing could be more relevant in the planet, in our communities, or in the human heart. The soul of any nation, the soul of any people is revealed by how we care for the most vulnerable and the defenseless. The widow, the orphan, the unborn in his or her mother's womb, the disabled, the elderly, the homeless, those that are racial minorities that have no voice or no advocate to speak up in their own defense. So we're talking about the meaning of the commandment, you shall not murder. And the first principle that we've learned today is that we should be individuals that revere all human life because it is created in the image of God. And secondly, we've got to clearly understand that the Bible teaches that life begins at conception. There is no other conclusion at which we can arrive. Psalm 139, the Bible says, you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, O Lord, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place. When I was woven together in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed body. And all the days ordained for me were written in your book before even one of them came to be. That is a profound statement about the sanctity of human life. Listen to a companion verse, Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you and before I was even conceived, God knew us. That's what the scripture's clearly indicating. Fearfully and wonderfully made in his image. In my humble opinion, our most grievous violation of the sixth commandment as a nation, even as a planet, is in fact abortion. I simply cite that in 1857, American governing documents said that Negroes or African Americans were not people in 1936, legal German documents in Nazi political culture were crystal clear that Jews were not people. In 1973, our highest courts decide that the unborn were not people. And I suggest that just because something is legal, that does not make it moral and that does not make it right in God's sight. Here's American war casualties, by the way. You may or may not be familiar that in the Revolutionary War, 25,000 Americans gave their life for freedom. In the Civil War, our most costly conflict of, uh, on the field of battle, almost exactly 500,000 Americans gave their life because each individual from the North and from the South were an American. In World War I, it was 116,000. In World War II, it was 407,000. The Korean War, 54,000. The Vietnam War, 58,000. The Gulf War, 293. The Iraqi War, 3,020. The War on the Unborn, 50 million and counting since abortion was legalized in 1973. Now hear my heart on this. People say you can't legislate morality. Really? Because I suggest that that's exactly what righteous societies do. They do in fact legislate morality because watch this. Every law reflects somebody's morality. Every law reflects somebody's values. I'm urging some of you gifted, 
passionate, dynamic young women and men that are sharing Bible study with me today. Consider a life of public service. Be the next governor. Be the next president. Be the next Supreme Court Chief Justice. Be individuals that can take in a way of humility, compassion, and love the righteous principles of God to a very sin-broken planet. I want you to listen to these words as a holy God subpoenas the conscience of a nation before the judgment seat of morality. I'm in Proverbs 24, listen. Rescue those being led away to death and hold back those staggering towards slaughter. If you say, but we knew nothing about this, does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he or she has done? And so this is in so many contexts, including these egregious violations of justice and American law in the taking of these lives I've cited at the beginning with George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. We cannot stand idly by because to be silent is to be complicit. The third thing that we understand in terms of the meaning is this, that as believers in Jesus Christ, in a spirit of love and humility, we need to be the righteous conscience of our culture and boldly stand up and speak up in the face of all injustice. I'm not talking about violating the law. I'm not talking about crusading. I'm not talking in any way about burning cities or towns down or hurting other individuals. But I'm saying through the appropriate corridors of power and law, that we stand up, that we speak up, and that we be relentless, motivated by love, with a spirit of humility, not arrogance, but a spirit of humility. We make a principled stand for something that is right simply because it is right. Let's wrap up our Bible study and look at the source. So we talked about the meaning. Now let's talk about the source of murder. Why do we murder? What is happening in the human heart? I've given three scripture passages that I want to read through very quickly. You follow along in, in your notes and in your Bible because the Bible is actually very clear about the root of murder. And the root always appears before the fruit. Jesus always got beyond overt behavior and he went right to internal intent. He knew that the root creates the fruit. I'm in Matthew 5. You've heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not murder, and anyone who murders will be subject to judgment. What's Jesus referencing? The Ten Commandments that at that time were some two to 3,000 years previous. He says, but I tell you, now watch this, that anyone who is angry with another will be subject to to judgment. And then in 1 John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, the word of God says, and we know that we have passed from death to life because we love our brothers. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that murder, the murderer has no eternal life in him. So in the first passage, Jesus said that if we're angry with, a bro with our brother or sister, we're subject to judgment. Here he says, hatred is already uh, in the place of murder. Murder has already been birthed in our hearts. And then Genesis 4, the Lord said to Cain, why are you so angry? We're at anger again. Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, Cain, you will be accepted. But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, Cain, but you must master it. So in these three passages, we are seeing clearly the root or the source of murder. Jesus is telling us that anger, 
hatred, unforgiveness, jealousy, arrogance, selfishness are the root of murder. In Genesis 4, 9, Cain snapped back at God and said, why do you keep asking me about my brother? Am I my brother's keeper? And here's the answer to that question in Genesis 4, 9. Yes, we are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. This is all about how we treat each other, how we care for one another, what ultimately lives in our heart, love or hatred, love or rage, love or revenge. Do a heart analysis today and ask yourself, what is living in my heart? Ultimately, the source of all these Unguarded human violence is rooted in sin, and the only ultimate cure for sin is the cross of Jesus Christ, who rose from the dead on the third day. Now, for those of you that have had a grave injustice, including you have lost a beloved family member, friend, fellow human being in life to an act of violent murder, We can either go through our days with revenge in our hearts or a savage bitterness in our soul, which would be completely understandable. But there is another option, and Jesus taught it. And a young man named Brant Jean demonstrates it. You may or may not remember that a few years ago, an off-duty police officer by the name of Amber Geiger thought she was in her own apartment, so to speak. The actual resident of that apartment, a Botham Jean, asked her who she was. She thought he was an intruder, and she killed him with her gun. I want you to watch this very brief video of the court trial for which she was sentenced to many years in prison. I want you to watch the grace the shocking ability, the capacity that is not of this world. It is not innate in humanity to respond the way this young brother who had just had his older brother gunned down. Watch this. I'm not going to say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't going to ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's, what, that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. That's deeply touching, isn't it? When he walks across that courtroom and he hugs her and she falls into his arms, when's the last time we've seen that demonstration of amazing grace? Only God can help us forgive when violence is done against us or another human that we cherish. We had a conversation with all the violence happening these days in the United States, the ensuing riots, the lootings, the anger. Uh, And by the way, many, many of the marches are peaceful, uh, protest in nature. I felt the need to learn more and to talk to some of the great leaders in our uh, church family here at the Bay Church. And 
I had an opportunity this past week to sit down with three men by the name of Warnell, Vontre, and Joseph. And these three men are godly men. They are good men. They are leaders both in the church and in our community at large. They are men of virtue and men of wisdom and understanding. And we had a conversation uh, that for me was transformational. I want you to open up your heart and hear what they're saying when they talk about what's happening in the human heart and what's happening in our culture these days. Check it out. People don't understand the institutional racism that has been laid down in American society for over the past 200 years. And, you know, we, we have this, we thought that civil rights in the 60s were going to change things. We thought that, you know, if we, change, if we put laws out there, it would make things equal. But the issue is when you wound a people, um, and those of us that, that, that work with individuals in ministry, when you wound the people, unless you begin to do the work to heal the wounding, you can, you can put all kind of Band-Aids you want on it. This is very difficult to talk about because, you know, you, you want to feel, feel safe. You want to feel like uh, whatever it is that you're going to say is going to be heard and it's going to reach people and hopefully make a change. And it's similar to what Joe was saying is like years and years and years of talking, years and years and years of whatever it is that people have done to take action. It's like, what is it going to take to understand that I deserve to live just like everybody else deserves to live. That's, that's the, the basics of it. The inferiority complex that I had growing up was just white people are better than black people. Because in my neighborhood, there's a lot of black people. We're poor. We don't have much of anything. It's all renters in apartments. And if I ever just so happen to be in a neighborhood, that's a white neighborhood. It's normally nice homes, nice cars, nice grocery stores, everything's clean, and if you make any trouble, the police will show up quickly. But in, in my neighborhood, the police don't always show up quickly unless they're just patrolling. But if you really needed them, normally the incident was over by the time they showed up. Um, but from, from a young person standpoint, yes, I truly believed that white people were just better than black people because we had nothing and they had a lot. And it was not until I worked at Clayton Valley High School and was actually around a lot of white people on a consistent basis that I began to understand, whoa, they do a lot of the same stuff that we do or the people I grew up with did. Not to say white people are just all bad, but just to honestly understand that white people make a lot of bad decisions like black people did. You know, nobody's better or worse, but just to understand that it's not that white people are perfect. Because in my psyche, I honestly thought white people don't do bad stuff. They don't, they don't get in trouble. But then over time, I just began to understand, wow, it's not that they're perfect, but there's so many safety nets for them. I think sometimes we in the church will say, well, we all love God. We're all the same. I don't see color. I don't do this. I don't do that. And the reality is that's not true, nor is it fair to all of us who come from beautiful backgrounds. Uh, you know, Jesus, God, our, our Heavenly Father created all of us on purpose. Right. And so to say that, uh, you know, that to use that as a blinder or to use, you know, the, the, the love of Christ as a blinder, it, it actually does a disservice to the purpose of why he was here, and why he died on the cross. Each one of us has to go on this journey of reconciliation, every single one of us. And this can't continue. We can't we can't go through another um, okay, well, we'll march, we'll, we'll get angry, we'll do these things, and then the news, the sound bites, will go to something else um, in a month, and then we'll kind of go back to life as usual. Life as usual cannot happen anymore. 
and it can't happen in the church. So right now, um, I think the first thing that has to be done is we as believers have to do our homework and start to unveil and expose the evil that has been embedded into our our, our culture, into our society, and, and our history. And, and when you start to understand that, when you gain that knowledge, then it'll make it easier for you to understand. Because it's hard for you to get someone on board with an idea if they don't understand what it is you want them to get behind. But what my challenge would be is that, that our white brothers and sisters would begin to speak up and, and to, to join us in the fight. We don't need you to speak for us, but we need you to speak up in this particular instance. Uh, we have been doing all the marching. We've been doing all the protesting. We, 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 we've done it. We've done it. But until other people start to join in, then it's just looked at as, well, that's just the black issue. And that's just the way it is. And we fall right back into that, that complacency. If we really want things to be different, if we really want to honor God, it's time to start making a difference first inwardly, then we can go externally. When we really get to that place of the love of Christ, it's not that we don't see color. It's that we see the splendor of what God created in a dark-skinned person. We see the splendor of what God created in a brown-skinned person. We see the splendor of what God created in a white-skinned person, and we can love them with that. And we love, because what we see is we see the glory of God. That, wow, look at God, and look at how he made us so different. And in each one of those is a different, almost like a different facet of a diamond. It's a different shade. It's a different part of God, but all together, we continue to make that family of God. And when we can really get to that point, we can do powerful things in this church and we can do powerful things in the Bay Area. So the question, as we hear from Warnell, Vontre, and Joseph, the question that God is asking as we look at this sixth commandment, it's the same question he's asking Cain, the first murderer. Cain, what? is in your heart. What is in your heart in reference of how you're feeling about your fellow human beings? Is there rage, anger, wrath, resentment, jealousy, murder? And so I hope that God will set you free. I pray with all of my heart that you will know the liberating power of Jesus Christ, that the Bible says whomever the Son is set free is free indeed. Let's pray, Father, for my friends and for myself as we embrace this very straightforward, direct uh, teaching about how we care for one another and how we treat one another and that we are never to do violence toward one another, but that we're to extend each other grace and forgiveness as human beings. I pray, God, that you go into homes uh, in the hearts, in the minds, uh, into the past for so many that are joining us uh, digitally uh, and online this weekend. And I pray that you set them free. I pray that you make them whole. I pray that they begin down the journey of what it means for themselves to be forgiven and released from their own sins. Holy God, make us individuals of peace individuals of grace and individuals of the most powerful change agent on the planet. Make us persons of love. We ask it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before we go, I want to say a few things to you very quickly. You may want to jot down a couple uh, of these items to remember. First of all, uh, this conversation, which we just shared with Warnell, Vontre, and Joseph, uh, we've actually posted it in its entirety online. You can watch the whole thing. I just wanted to give you some of the highlight moments that might be meaningful to all of us. Secondly, 
We have a prayer walk for justice that we are planning here at the Bay Church that will be on June 11th, uh, right here in Concord. We'll end at City Hall, and uh, there will be more details coming online. Just go to our website, thebay.church, and you'll find everything that you need to know. Um, I want to encourage you to be serving during this whole pandemic shelter period, our adopt a school, our compassion teams are serving hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands even of underserved families and individuals right here in the immediate area surrounding our church campus. So rather than be overwhelmed by what's happening, Let's put on a mask, roll up our sleeves, wash our hands with sanitizer, and go out and love and serve and feed the hungry and give hope and love and joy in Jesus' name. Next, I want to say to you, I listened to uh, a man that they call him Bishop T.D. Jakes, but to me, he's an oracle. I listened to a talk that he gave online in a way... Uh, that I, I, I just could not get enough of it. I felt like I understood better than I ever had. And I urge you to get online. He has a, a great church in Texas. It's called the Potter's House, Bishop T.D. Jakes. I really, really encourage you to listen to that fabulous man of God. Finally, we're gonna close this weekend uh, with a song called The Blessing that was sung by many individuals, choirs uh, of many, many churches throughout the Bay Area. They are singing a blessing over the Bay Area. Watch this, and I'll see you next week. We hope that you were impacted and encouraged by Pastor John's heartfelt message. If you need prayer, our pastors are ready to pray with you. Feel free to click the live prayer button and it will open up a private chat session with one of our pastors. And we want you to know that this Thursday, June 11th at 1 p.m., we're gonna gather together as a community and do a prayer walk for justice. Our country is hurting right now. Our African-American community is hurting right now. And it's so important that we all come together and do what the Bible tells us to do to pray one for another, especially during times like this. If you want more information about this event, go to our events page on the website, thebay.church. Thank you so much for watching today. God bless you all, and we'll see you next week.